Hi, I'm Jeff Hahn, RCR Wireless's policy correspondent in Washington, D.C. Joining me today is former Congressman Rick Boucher, who represented the Virginia 9th District from 1983 to 2011. As member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and its Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, and the Internet, Mr. Boucher has a unique understanding of Americans' telecom policy, having helped craft much of it. Mr. Boucher now serves as the honorary chair of the Internet Innovation Alliance. Congressman, welcome. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss a number of topics, specifically lifeline reform and net neutrality, uh, which I'm eager to hear your opinion on. First, let's uh, talk about lifeline reform. This program that has been around since the Reagan era, and the FCC has stirred a fair amount of controversy because it's looking to expand the $1.6 billion program from cell phone and landline to broadband. Do you think the F FCC is right to expand the program, and do you think concerns raised over waste and fraud are warranted? All right, and then I Next, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the net neutrality debate, specifically the FCC's waiting to hear uh, a court ruling, and it receives some good news in the form of uh, a number of petitions being filed in support of it from Internet to companies. Um, do you think this will affect the outcome of the court's decision? And what are your general thoughts on net neutrality? The Federal Lifeline Program was established during the Reagan administration for one basic purpose. And that was to make sure that low-income Americans could afford basic telephone service. And in meeting that goal, the program has been remarkably successful, largely because of Lifeline. Today, the United States has the highest connection rate for telephone service of any nation in the world. So it's been very successful in achieving its initial very limited purpose. But today, Lifeline is outdated because it doesn't cover broadband. And broadband is now the way that Americans prefer to communicate. And it's absolutely essential for economic success, for a complete education, and to access services such as health care. So the time really has come for a broadband and, and lifeline reform. The reform that we're proposing at the Internet Innovation Alliance for Lifeline has three basic elements. First, the program should be expanded to cover broadband. Secondly, we think it's very important that the carriers no longer have a role in determining who is eligible for broadband service. Today, the carriers make that decision. And the carriers have every incentive to qualify as many subscribers as possible because they want as many subscribers as they can have. And so applicants for Lifeline who may not be qualified oftentimes wind up in the program, and that wastes program resources. It misdirects the resources so they don't always get into the hands of the most deserving people. We think instead the states should be relied upon to determine who is qualified for the Lifeline program. The states today decide who's eligible for food stamps. They decide who's eligible for Medicaid. They decide who's eligible for food lunches. Uh, the, school lunch, the school lunch program. And we think that as the states make determinations for eligibility for these programs, they should also be able to sign people up for the Lifeline program. The eligibility standards are the same, and so why not coordinate the Lifeline enrollment with enrollment in these other federal low-income programs? The third reform, we think, makes a great deal of sense is to send the Lifeline subsidy directly to the consumer. Don't send it directly to the carrier. Give it to the consumer in a way that makes it portable, and the consumer can then shop among the carriers and choose the carrier, wired or wireless, best suited for that consumer's needs. And then choose the service that carrier offers that best meets that consumer's desires. These reforms, we think, are fundamental and would modernize Lifeline for the 21st century expand it to broadband, have coordinated enrollment in the program with the states as the states make decisions for other low-income assistance programs, and make the benefit portable, send it to the consumer, let the consumer shop among carriers, and choose the one best suited to that consumer's needs. All right. A longest-standing telecom policy debate of this century is net neutrality started a decade ago. It's been very controversial ever since, and it's still unresolved. 
I'm a longtime proponent of network neutrality guarantees. I think the network needs to be open. I think it's important that the uh, last mile providers not be in a position to discriminate in favor of their own content to the disadvantage of unaffiliated programmers and to the disadvantage of their subscribers. So I strongly favor network neutrality. I've had that position since the start of this debate 10 years ago. And I have been frustrated because we have not been able to this point to embed network neutrality principles firmly into federal law. And the fight is still not won. The FCC recently uh, recategorized broadband as a telecommunications service and has applied common carrier rules to the broadband pathways. Now that step in inevitably is going to retard investment by the broadband providers. The broadband providers now face a great deal of uncertainty about just how extensive the regulation of broadband is going to be. And as long as that uncertainty persists, broadband providers are going to step back in terms of making uh, large investments in the broadband network. Now that operates to the disadvantage of the entire American public and the American economy. So we really need to settle this debate. Those, uh, some who are network neutrality proponents say that they're very happy that the FCC has now undertaken reclassification of broadband as a Title II service, applying common carrier rules, because they say that will protect network neutrality principles. But the fact is the FCC's rule rests on a bed of sand. It can be washed away with a court decision, and the broadband providers are now in court litigating the FCC's reclassification rule, and they have pretty strong arguments. They say the FCC has interpreted congressional statutes to declare that broadband is an information service for the last decade. Now all of a sudden, without any significant justification and without building a supporting record, the FCC has reversed ground and has declared that all of that precedent is invalid and that broadband is a telecommunication service subject to common carrier regulation. Now, the FCC under court doctrine simply can't reverse ground that quickly without building a substantial record. Anytime a regulatory agency throws out decades of precedent and abruptly reverses, reverses ground on a long-held position, the courts apply a special scrutiny to that action. And it's very doubtful in my mind and in the mind of many observers that the FCC's order is going to be able to withstand that very high degree of scrutiny. So, you know, the FCC order could be washed out uh, based on a legal decision. Even more understandable, uh, perhaps, is the fact that if a Republican wins the presidency next year, there's then going to be an FCC majority that is three to two Republican, and it's virtually certain that one of the early orders of business for a Republican FCC would be, again, to declare broadband to be an information service. And when that happens, the network neutrality protections contained in the recent reclassification order would be lost. So the network neutrality proponents who say that they have achieved their long-held goal of, of a victory for network neutrality with the reclassification order uh, need to think again. It can be swept away with a court decision it can be swept away with the next presidential election. Now there is a better way, and that better way is for Congress to put this decade-long debate to bed once and for all by passing a very simple bill. The bill would have two components. The first of those would be to embed strong network neutrality protections into permanent law. That uh, statute would then be virtually immune from a court challenge, and for all time, until Congress acts again, uh, the network neutrality guarantees would be protected. That would give the proponents of network neutrality the long-sought victory that has eluded them up to this point in time. The second provision of that bill would be to declare that broadband is an information service and that common carrier regulation cannot be imposed upon it. And that would give the broadband providers 
and their Republican allies in Congress the victory that they're seeking. So uh, this is an instance where legislation really is possible because the issues are narrowly defined. They're two in number. Both sides of the equation, Democrats and Republicans, have uh, relatively equal leverage. Each party can give to the other the thing that it wants the most. And in that kind of circumstance, legislation really is possible. The Republicans have moved a very long way in this debate. I've watched every step in this parade now for the past decade. And I can say that up until the last couple of months, the Republicans have strongly resisted providing network neutrality guarantees. And now the Republicans have offered to Democrats embedding strong network neutrality principles in a statute in return for continuing the long-held designation of broadband as an information service and placing that provision in permanent statutory form as well. So the opportunity is there. I'm a Democrat. I have urged my Democratic colleagues, my former colleagues, my friends in Congress to accept this Republican offer because it is sensible for Democrats giving them the victory on network neutrality they have long sought and which they have not obtained in the uh, uh, reclassification order at the FCC because of its impermanence. And it also is good for America because it will free the carriers of legal uncertainty and put them back in a strong position to make investments that our network needs. That's the right way forward. And I very much hope that Congress uh, will sometime during the course of this year or early next year pass a network neutrality bill that embodies those principles.